Welcome to Limitless, the blind beginnings podcast where seeing things differently inspires limitless possibilities. This podcast is being brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Limitless was created in order to inform, educate, entertain, and share stories from within the blind and partially sighted community, in order to show the world that the opportunities for those who are blind or partially sighted are truly limitless. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to your host, the executive director and founder of Blind Beginnings, Sean Marcelet. Welcome back to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marcelet. Thank you for joining us. We have an exciting episode today. I don't know if you know this, but this podcast is being released the week of International Dance Day, which I didn't actually know was a thing. And in honor of that, we thought it would be fun to talk about dance. Uh, I guess the only Blind Beginnings program that really involved dance in our history, and that was our Flash Mob. And I have three co-hosts today who all participated in the Flash Mob and also were involved in the planning and creation of the Blind Beginnings Flash Mob. So welcome, Randy, Ginny, and Nika. Hey. Hello. Great to be back again. Hello, everybody. Yeah. So did you guys know it was International Dance? dance day i did not actually and i'm so happy that there is a day that acknowledges dance yeah that's kind of cool i was like you i had no idea what it was until you told me <laughs> yes <laughs> i will make it unanimous then and that i also was not aware of this so uh i think you've all been on the podcast you're all you all have a visual impairment you've all been involved with blind beginnings for quite some time and uh so let's just jump into talking about our flash mob do any of you remember what year we did the flash mob because i don't the idea kind of came about in 2014 and it actually took about a year for us to actually put it all together, which we'll talk a, a bit more about later. But then the actual flash mob itself uh, happened in October of 2015. Awesome. Did you have to look that up or did you, re do you remember? I somehow remember it and I don't, <laughs> I guess it was just that memorable. I actually thought it was 2016, so I'm glad you didn't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like scrambling to try and do the math. I'm like, okay, if I was this old, then what year would it be in? Well, I couldn't even remember if my son had been born yet. So clearly, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> but 2014, he was only a year old. So that means he was only a year old when we started planning. So that's my excuse. So I'm still, you know, baby brain. So I think that I wanted a flash mob, but I feel like that's probably not like, does anybody remember whose idea it was or how this, how this idea even came to be? Wasn't it because someone did it in their school or something and then kind of came up with the yeah. idea? A teacher had approached Sean and was like, oh, hey, we did this cool thing. You guys should do this cool thing. And then we made the cool thing happen. <laughs> well, um, I thought it was like a combination of somebody presented the idea, but then also Sean really wanted it at the same time. So she was like all in favor of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's kind of what I thought too. But I, I think I don't know if I quite even knew what a flash mob was when it was first presented to me and then you know, the idea of a flash mob, maybe we should define a flash mob in case anybody doesn't yeah. know what that is. So, well, just in case any of our listeners haven't ever encountered a flash mob, it's basically, it can take many formats, but it's a an event that is choreographed and planned out ahead of time to appear spontaneous in the location it happens. So the general public or people who aren't, you know, in the know, let's say, uh, won't realize that this is going to happen at this day and time and place. But of course it takes quite a lot of time planning to get there. So it's not, it's not nearly as spontaneous as it looks. But it, can be, <laughs> it can be musical with instruments. It can be 
uh, theater. Um, our case, we did uh, dance flash mob. So we had some music playing and we set up a routine that, you know, over quite a period of time as we'll get into and uh, danced. And I mean, the idea if you're blind, well, I guess two things. First of all, if a flash mob just like starts up in the mall and you're in the mall, it would look like everyone is spontaneously joining in and somehow following along. Uh, so if you're blind, you you wouldn't have a chance of even trying to follow along. But in reality, everybody already knew and they weren't just randomly in the mall in those cases, right? Right. It was um, everyone who was involved um, knew when it was going to happen, where it was going to happen, and had learned the uh, sequence and everything. So it, to an outsider, it probably would have looked... Um, like an interesting coincidence that there were, you know, about a couple of dozen blind people in the same part of Metro Town, Vancouver, Burnaby, BC at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had any of you been in flash mobs before this? I have not. And in elementary school, we've had assemblies where they showed us videos of flash mobs for anti-bullying and the environment. And my EA would have to describe what was happening. And I always thought it was really cool and always wanted to be a part of it, but I never got to until Blind Beginnings decided to do it. Yeah, I, I'm similar in the sense that I never um, had done it. I always knew what they were, haven't really watched videos about them, but uh, for me, dancing it, period, was just something I was always um, staying away from before this happened. And I never got the chance to participate in one, unfortunately. Um, there was one time where it was like, it was it was some kind of Facebook event where it was supposed to be like the world's biggest flash mob or something. And it was, you know, like a cross continent international kind of event that if, you know, everyone could go to this video and learn this dance and then everyone could do it at the same time. And I was out of town. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and I can't remember where I was or like why like it was obviously some kind of trip where I couldn't have done it, it like it wouldn't have been appropriate for me to do it at random because mm -hmm. of you know the other people around me were not involved so yeah. I didn't get the chance to actually do that but I almost did too bad yeah yeah and I think Jenny you made an interesting point about dancing in general when mm -hmm. you can't see i know for me you know school dances anywhere weddings anywhere where you're kind of expected to dance was always ugh, like grown so stressful, stressful. yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it definitely was and not only that it's like you know it's i think um sighted people you know they they they've seen people dance whether that's on tv whether it's the people around them and i think for us, it's like, how do we know that we're kind of doing kind of what everyone else is doing? How do we know mm -hmm. we're not looking super strange and mm -hmm. kind of um, doing something super out there? People have told me, you know, you just move your body to the music, but it's like, it doesn't really look that easy sometimes. Yeah. And I think it's more than that. Like people say that, oh, just do anything. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I feel yeah. like but, there's but some then rules. They, but then they judge you when you do something weird. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I, my favorite kind of dancing is definitely the kind of like line dancing or square dancing where you're oh, like yeah. memorizing a series of steps. Everyone's <laughs> doing the same thing. I can remember lots of things. That's no problem. So the flash mob <laughs> was perfect. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about how we did this, because as Ginny mentioned, it took over a year from when we started to when we actually did the flash mob in public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, does one of you want to launch into how this started? Well, I mean, we know, we already know how it started, or at least like where the idea came from, at least. Mm -hmm. um, the implementing, it, you know, that idea into, I guess the first part was like trying to figure out how how are we going to do this? You know, I do come from a background of mm, recreational dance. I've done several different styles over a couple of decades, um, none to any uh, highly technical degree. Let's say I wasn't like in it for competitions or, or elite, you know, classes, not stuff like that. But 
I at least have some basis of knowledge plus um, because I'm on the more sighted end, I've obviously seen and watched, you know, different dance videos, be it dancing with the stars or old Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire and stuff like that with the cane, with um, the dancing canes, the walking canes that men used to use with uh, the tuxedos and high dress up kind of functions. So first thing was we made a committee and, and started from there. A lot of what we did in the beginning, kind of before all the rehearsals and stuff, was mostly technical stuff. So we worked on putting together the music and kind of more like administrative kind of behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. And I feel like we were pretty, we had some criteria for the music, right? Do you guys remember? We did. This was like the first committee I joined. So I was actually very, very new, but I remember like for the music, we definitely wanted it to be very uh, positive and music that was kind of like not only fun to dance to, but uplifting. I know um, I definitely, when I was looking around, I chose a song, uh, it's in the flash one, it's called People Like Us by Kelly Clarkson. And I was like, yes this totally fits our theme because people like us, we always have to stick together and that can apply to anybody, but it also applies to us, you know, who are blind and mm -hmm. um, have those challenges. And I think most of our songs uh, were like that. Another song that we had featured was at the end and it was um, some of the lyrics were, if I get knocked down or sorry, when I get knocked down, I get up again. So again, like kind of, showing that you know things aren't always going to you know go how they should but that doesn't mean you should get up again i mean shouldn't get up again <laughs> um so yeah just kind of it took i think it took us a lot of time to to pick the music because what? we had so many choices but we had to narrow it down yeah and everybody had their idea of what they wanted to include and then we didn't want it to be like a 20 minutes flash mob. So we had to pick like pieces of the songs and then, you know, somehow make them connect to each other. And it was quite a challenge, actually. Mm -hmm. Definitely. A lot of uh, we got, you know, it wasn't just us committee members coming up with ideas of music either. It was mostly us. But, um, you know, we kind of took submissions, listened to them all together and stuff, you know, to see how, how people felt, you know, is this one maybe too slow or, you know, too fast or something. And, and then uh, I kind of did like a rough cut and just took like our favorite chunks of a bunch of songs and stuck it together. Um, I am by no means a technical person in regards to editing media so it was very rough but it was just like here's maybe something you know it's just so we could at least hear them all together and not you know having to fast forward through a bunch of different songs you know it, that's not the same you know it doesn't give you the same kind of idea of how it'll sound and then we passed it over to one of our other committee members who isn't here on this podcast recording uh, and his name it was owen and he became affectionately known as dj spacebar <laughs> <laughs> yes because he is a dj and um and he helped yeah. he came to all of our rehearsals and ran the music and and helped on the day and yeah we really thank you owen we appreciate you uh, yeah another thing we did too i remember at the beginning is we definitely wanted to have this process documented um so right from the get-go we had a volunteer who was generous enough to donate her time to help us document um, our practices, video some of our practices, as well as actually video the flash mob on the day. And I think if you if you take a look at the video on YouTube, it, it shows a tiny glimpse of some of our practices in there too. Mm -hmm. I remember when we were choosing music though, because Randy, choreographed the dance for the most part mm -hmm. most of it you were it's like you were kind of already thinking of what actions we could do to certain parts of the songs I think that sort of helped you choose which chunks if I remember yeah correctly. um some of it was just like what seemed to work with the words like you know if the words are saying something about up in the sky or you know down or whatever you know it, it gives you kind of a, a an obvious direction of a type of movement you can do 
the hardest part really was because, you know, our goal here was for all the participants in the flash mob to be visually impaired, partially sighted, totally blind, and their families and friends. I had, it had to, everything had to be moves that I could, or, you know, that could be explained fairly easily, you know? So I could, so a lot of, you know, when I mentioned Fred Astaire before with, you know, the dancing cane and stuff, there's lots of old videos of that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's very kind of fancy and you twirl the cane around and like dance around it in a circle while it's on the floor and stuff. And that's not very, um, easy to explain without being able to watch it Mm -hmm. so you know I did have some like I say I have some you know recreational background in dance so I have some idea of music and movement and stuff like that and then went with the words and then a lot of it was like stringing it together but then also with the group of dancers seeing what actually worked and what didn't because we were quite diverse too. Even, you know, we had um, not, you know, maybe there was someone out there who could definitely do that twirling routine, but we had uh, little children as well, um, you know, who were quite young. So having a routine uh, that could work for the whole family and was quite diverse, uh, I think was really, really challenging to come up with. I mean, I didn't come up with it, but I think that also might've been a challenge for you Definitely. Yeah. It was all age range, really. Um, I think we had like down to like elementary school ages that were participating, some siblings, and I'm not sure how high the age range range went, but between in, in there, there was also like all different varying abilities of movement and dance and even just uh, like physical mobility. Some people have different kinds mm-hmm. of you know, mobility issues or uh, different problems with their lower, you know, body and joints and stuff like that. So it had to be adapted for something that everyone could do. And that um, I would say that the vast majority of people that did participate have next to zero or very minimal da- true dance experience, um, you know, being that it's definitely a harder activity for people with, um vision problems to get into accessibility wise so mm-hmm. you know we, we actually a bunch of beginners <laughs> yes <laughs> for sure i think the majority definitely were um we kind of used our committee as a practice so like the committee learned the dance steps before we started teaching them to everyone else that was going to participate so it was kind of like if randy couldn't get us to figure it out then we were we were like the guinea pigs <laughs> and if we weren't going to grasp it then it then it was kind of a tip that this is going to be tricky to then mm. teach this to everybody else i think randy you ended up making a video as well for us i think um where you described it and i think like i even wrote it down tried to write it down as best i could step by step and i think then we gave those as handouts for everybody as well right. yeah Although that was challenging too, right? Because if you're watching a video, it's, it's reverse. I don't know. Like you would, you would have had to. Yeah. Mirrored. Thank you. (laughs) Honestly, I don't remember doing that part. Um, (laughs) But I mean, the other thing too, is like, because I, you know, either choreographed most of it or, you know, with the help of the committee members, when we were doing like that kind of test sequence on all on all the different parts of it and stuff and I don't remember doing the video but I also don't remember think it would be that hard because I was the one you know you wouldn't have the same issue with the mirror mirroring image in the video at least from the if I'm trying to describe it standpoint because I'm the one doing it (laughs) I think I don't know if you had to do it with your back to the camera though so that you could say like left arm up draw and then you'd be describing what you were doing as you I don't know I don't know how you did it but yeah. probably most likely what I did um again I don't remember actually doing this so Jenny has a better memory than I um maybe I've blocked out certain parts of that year. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was only it was a year I mean you know I don't know how long normal flash mobs take but I mean we were meeting on what a week or a monthly basis for practices like once we got past once we got into teaching the other participants and stuff you know mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. not a lot 
you know, I, I feel like most flash mobs, if it's like a school event or like a friends, you know, a choir or a band, something, you know, it's more concentrated, you know, might be like several practices a week in a shorter number of weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I'm sure I've forgotten lots of little things that happened that year. Yeah. We definitely had more than once a month practices when it got closer and it was kind of like lots and lots of opportunities for people to come. And if you needed more practice, you could come more often. And again, like if you're sighted, cause we did have some parents, we had a grandparent, we had some board member volunteers, blind and sight, like we had quite a, a mix. Um, but if you're sighted, you can kind of watch what everyone else is doing. If you kind of have a pretty good sense of the dance, but if you're blind, you don't have that option. So you really do have to know your dance like completely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of it kind of also had to do with muscle memory because the more practices we did kind of more ingrained, it was in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, just referring to what Sean said there a minute ago too, it's almost like you're all individually you know, within yourself doing a little solo because you can't look at around and, oh, am I yeah. doing, oh, oh, never mind. It was the right arm switch, you know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Little solo, but there you're in a, a mass of bodies around you. So one of the super, I guess my favorite part, I think of the whole dance was when it starts off, we all had our canes folded. Um, so we had to get in, in a line, like we had to get in position without being in position when the dance started. So we had to sort of figure that out. But then there's a part in the dance where we unfold our canes. And and, and I, I don't know if it was shocking to people or not, but we wanted it to be <laughs> like, oh my goodness, we they're all blind. Was, like in a good way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the song was called Bang Bang and we literally just came out with the bang. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. So we wanted our white canes in the dance. Um, obviously we wanted people to know we were blind, but not everyone had a white cane. So we also had to like scrounge up old canes and lend them out and people would yeah. come to practice and borrow a cane and. <laughs> yeah, it's not everyone had a cane the right size. <laughs> yeah. But then, I don't know, it made me think of it because you were talking about you know, being your own person, doing your own individual performance, because at one point we hold, we held the canes above our heads and you don't want to, I think they were folded in half at that point. But. We, we ended up folding them in half because um, between, you know, most people's arms aren't long enough for a, what we say on average, at least four foot cane. Mm -hmm. um, but also we were limited on space and didn't want to, you know, take our neighbor's heads off. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so my cane in on the day jammed and I couldn't fold it in half and I had to just do the dance with <laughs> the whole cane full Oops. out extended uh, yeah oh I think I, that often happened to us in practice too because we'd hit them on the ground and then we'd have to like hit it to unjam it a couple times so even for uh the one move too where we were kind of doing that pendulum swing they were folded in half mm-hmm <laughs> and it was also kind of a task also hiding it because, you know, there were a bunch of us in Blind Beginnings t-shirts and holding canes. So on the actual day, we kind of had to hide the cane at our side, we wore jackets over a shirt, kind of had to like tuck the cane like in the jacket and try and cover it. That's right. Because yeah, if we're all wearing the same shirt and we're <laughs> in the mall, people are going to notice before yeah. they start dancing. Yeah. We didn't want to look like two dozen blind people. We just wanted to surprise. <laughs> yeah, like we spread out blind people. We spread out like all over the like kind of in the main atrium where we did it. We split mm -hmm. in like groups of two or three and kind of pretended like we were hanging out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had like those who had some vision assigned to guide those who didn't into position when the time came as we gradually joined in. So there was a lot, a lot of details to just to, to put it all together. Yeah, even on the actual day, I started off sideways and Randy actually was, she was great. She was, um, she was not only was she calling out the moves, but she was calling out to me to turn and face forward. <laughs> so we, you know, like there was little hiccups on the day, but again, 
you know, it, as long as you don't, you know, make a big deal out of it and stop and be like, oh, I was turned around. Like, you know, mm -hmm. nothing big <laughs> ever came out of that, um, you know, comes out of it. But yeah, I, I remember I was turned around for like the whole first part of the dance. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's on I YouTube. I forgot about that. So, <laughs> and like, if I watched the video again, I'd probably, you know, be able to see it. Or I, I was kind of trying to keep an eye on that everyone behind me got where they needed to be but i also was at the front so there's not much i could do mm -hmm. you know i can't like you know nudge them into place if they're 20 feet behind me <laughs> yes uh i mean we also talked about where so we chose metro town um we had considered do we want to do it outdoors or indoors where do we need to get permission where can we have a sound system like there were a lot of those kinds of of details to work out as well yeah i think the thing with metro town is it's a very central place and you know like a lot of us have shopped there before and we know how busy it can get especially on a weekend and it's also right by a sky train station too and a bus loop so that kind of makes it even more central and more noticeable yeah and we had to email them out and make sure that we we could find a place that could accommodate it and i think it did take us a while to actually pick our location and pick our day mm -hmm. uh, because we also didn't want to make it like a busy saturday right and i think we chose a sunday on purpose to uh, make sure that it wasn't super crowded either well we wanted it busy but yeah that was a one of the things like we wanted a lot of people to notice but then you don't want it so busy that we can't even exactly do what we need to do yeah and i think that was our balancing act that we had we had several conversations about that because we definitely mm -hmm. wanted it to be busy but we didn't want it to be crowded uh around us and um not to mention too like a bunch of us were school age so it also wasn't really feasible to do it on a weekday either mm -hmm. and we had parents and other people adults too that worked yeah mm -hmm. it was a challenge definitely scheduling the practices the actual day of the event and getting you know all those people together at the same you know relatively on time together and everything i we actually moved offices blind beginnings moved offices from the time we started the planning till <laughs> the time we finished it i was thinking about that because the first practices were in our our very first blind beginnings office and then we finished them in the other office and like it it was a process it was <laughs> it was a long involved process so do you guys think we achieved what we hoped we would through the flash mob or maybe i guess what did we hope we would achieve i know for me i was hoping i wanted to it just was another opportunity to showcase the capabilities of people who are blind and you know hopefully people would see our flash mob and think wow look at that look at what blind people can do I would definitely say we did, um, you know, whether it was the people in the mall on the day seeing something that probably surprised them, because I'm pretty sure it's fair to say that if you asked or showed a sighted person, a blind person doing dance, they would probably be surprised because that's not common, I guess. Um, so whether it was the people there on the day of who were surprised by us you know, twirling into view behind them or um, the, you know, two or 3,000 people who have since watched the, the videos on YouTube, which we do also have a version that is um, described as well as the original not described version. Mm -hmm. So between those two videos, there's about, um, you know, close to 4,000 views. So that's, you know, maybe 4,000 people who wouldn't have seen this and have maybe had their eyes opened. Yeah, I think for me too i agree with randy i think every one of us had our own goals for doing this and i definitely think some of them have been achieved I, for me personally i i was so new and i was like okay, i'll give this a try and i think the flash mob is what really got me into blind beginnings um because it showed me personally it, you know, along with other people, as Randy said, that I can dance. It's not that blind people can't. It's it's more about the visual world around you and that you just don't know what moves people are doing. You just don't know if everyone is doing 
them in sequence with you. It's just all of that stuff Mm -hmm. um, to be figured out. Once all that stuff is figured out, there's no reason why you can't dance. And I think for me, kind of proving that to myself and overcoming the, the many years of people, you know, pushing me away from it subtly was was huge uh, because yes society society also learned a lot but I think having the impact on yourself it was more meaningful because if you can't believe that you can do it how are you supposed to show society that you can and I think that's really important because until you are able to tell yourself yeah, I can do this or okay let's do this challenge um to kind of show society you know, you're not going to be able to do that. You're just going to sit there and they're not really going to learn. That was my whole thing with it. Mm -hmm. I totally and completely agree with Ginny. And I think for me, it was such a like, that's when it really clicked. And that's when my mind shift kind uh, mindset shifted from kind of being a scared young teenager who was not confident in herself to someone who actually believed that she could accomplish something and I kind of figured okay if this flash mob is able to kind of change the narrative about what blind people can do with dance then why can't it translate to other things I figured okay if this is kind of proving that a lot of the professionals who said I couldn't dance like maybe this is also proof that I could study what I wanted in university this is proof that We can travel independently, go on school trips by ourselves. And I think this impacted me in in more than just dance, but also just having the confidence to be able to partake in things that I don't think I would have done when I was a lot younger. Oh, I love that. That's so, it's funny when you're on the programming side of the fence, you know, or like creating programs and a program like this that took a year to kind of get to the end results, you sort of think, was this like, is this really, I don't know, is this, was it, is it a valuable use of time and resources and, you know, doing a flash mob, but, but just what you guys just said (laughs) tells me that it was like, that's amazing. That's so great. I wish we could do it again. I know like I've talked about it a little bit, but I definitely, I don't remember the entire routine because I haven't, like I can't physically watch the videos, but I definitely want to take this, you know, in different parts, you know, maybe do one on Vancouver Island Mm -hmm. or maybe go on tour. I think they, (laughs) no, yeah. Go on tour. I love it. A flash mob tour. (laughs) No, I just. Yeah, sure. Or I think I, people I, would start to recognize us. And it might, we might lose some of that spontaneity, you know. <laughs> but I definitely think kind of doing it in different places definitely would kind of, you know, show other people in different areas too. I mm. definitely want to do something like this again. Yeah. What about you, Randy? I mean, we might have to hold off on the tour for a bit, but <laughs> <laughs> after COVID, um, of course. <laughs> Um, I would definitely enjoy doing one again, whether it's the same one or a different one. I'm not entirely sure I would want to be at the helm to the same capacity as before. Like maybe if there was like another person who could co share it and everything, you know, cause it was, it was a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, it was a lot of fun despite the, all the hard work. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's a lot of fun, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's, it, it's, just, it's so much fun to actually do it with like all the people the jokes that come up there was definitely a few inside jokes that came out of the year or so of, of mm-hmm. practices and um but then to actually also like perform it you know because it is still a performance even though you're not on a stage in the or traditional sense it's you kind of still get a bit of a rush from that and then you know it, it's great just you know everyone applauds at the end because even if they have no idea who you are or why you're there it was just you know hey cool nice performance that was fun so I'd totally yeah. be up another one. And the symbolism of the choreography and just kind of the way the dance formed, I think was really cool because at first it started out, you know, Randy did like a solo and then slowly like a small group of us danced and then a bunch of people joined. And I kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm grasping at straws, but to me, it kind of reminded me of how like 
like me and I'm sure a lot of other people when we were younger felt like we were isolated and alone and then Mm -hmm. everyone kind of came together in like this blind beginnings family community and like we were no longer alone or isolated and we had each other so I think that was really meaningful for me no you guys Mm -hmm. (laughs) wow yeah I know I totally had that thought too because you know we start off with this just tonight's gonna be a good night you know we have this one person kind of coming onto the floor and then look at us there's like a whole crowd of us and it's we get knocked down but we get up again and it's all of us and I think Mm. yeah my heart is full you guys (laughs) so beautiful Uh, it was so fun and i totally remember the applause at the end and it it was a rush it was a rush that's but think of like some of the young kids that did it so if this was 2014 when we started yeah uh, that's that's like (laughs) seven years ago i'm thinking of yeah we had seven-year-olds participating yeah right like how empowering yeah. for them to be dancing with their white canes and being applauded and yeah so cool yeah. and randy and how old would would you have been leading all of us through this dance um a couple years after graduation i graduated at 17 let's say 19 ish yeah that's impressive. wow a couple years out of a small town high school moving to the big city kind of situation yeah it's impressive no formal, absolutely no formal choreographing experience at all or even recreational choreographing experience not to mention teaching blind people how to dance <laughs> there were many challenges but you know some of them also um you know collectively the people as the, i was trying to teach them they were finding ways also to be like hey maybe if you describe it this way it'll make sense to so and so over there yeah and we so kind of came of- we came up with like terminology for different moves too oh right? yeah we yeah. did yeah, i don't so remember any of it but it was a lot of collaboration really mm-hmm. you know yeah. i guess kind of like once unfortunately i guess like the first you know the large chunk of the initial you know, project and stuff was before there was all the participants. So a lot of it, there wasn't as much as many people to collaborate on it, but then, you know, you know, everything came from all around different people, different ways to describe things, different people who were, you know, making jokes about how we, what we named that move or, you know, stomping on the ground, Mm -hmm. you know, all different kinds of personalities, um, you know, involved. Mm-hmm. I think also to Randy, do you remember when uh, we were we were like all so focused on the dancing? We're like, oh, we should probably smile because <laughs> you know you you want to look like you know you're you know you're enjoying yourself, which we were, but you know we were so concentrated on the moves that mm-hmm. our faces looked very set. And I remember I had such a I was so resistant to it I was like I cannot my cheekbones are hurting because I was <laughs> trying to smile but also trying to think of the moves and I think we actually like had a comp like a kind of you know silly little competition where it was like okay you're gonna do this one practice everybody's smiling whoever stays smiling the whole time gets a cookie and it was, it was great <laughs> I think the kids really loved it well hmm. thanks you guys for bringing me back this was a pretty fantastic program and it was fun to kind of relive it again tonight i want to wish everybody a happy international dance day on april 29th and um i guess check out our youtube video of our flash mob it it was pretty cool thanks so much for joining me yeah thanks for having me You've been listening to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marcelet. If you have a question, a comment, a request for a future topic, send us an email to limitless at blindbeginnings.ca. Like us, share our podcast, leave us a rating, and join us again next time. This podcast has been brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Music for this podcast is composed by Sean Bishop and Clement Chow. Production and audio editing by Rob Minot. For more information about Blind Beginnings and the work it does to support children and youth who are blind and partially sighted, along with their families, 
visit us on the web at www.blindbeginnings.ca. And also remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.